All right, so we're going to do a couple. We need to make a couple of changes. There's something I left out in your package file. Um, so go ahead and click on package.json. And in this section called dependencies, you need to add the highlighted line. So what we're doing here is we're telling, hey, for this project, in addition to being dependent upon the MongoDB module, which is what we're going to focus on today, and I did remember to put that in, we are also dependent on the .env module. And I'll explain in a moment what that's used for. Okay. So when all is said and done, your package.json, by adding that one line to your package.json, it will now look like mine. When we start getting more into like the web app thing after break, um, we'll focus more on this package.json and what's in here and why it's in here and how it works. Um, but for now, this is basically just a way of saying our project depends upon a couple of different node modules, specifically one called .env of a certain version and one called MongoDB of a certain version. Once you've added this line of code, we now need to install both of these node modules. And the way we do that is we open up a new terminal and we simply type npm. npm stands for Node Package Manager. Um, we use it for, for several things, one of which is we also use it to install all these modules we need. So we do npm install and it will look through the package.json and install all the packages we need. You can also just do npm space i, which is short for install, um, if you want as well. So it'll download a couple things, it will install a couple things, um, and now we can actually um, use those modules in our code. So let's switch over to db.js. There's not much in it yet. And this is where we're going to um, interact with the database. So we're going to actually um, get a reference to uh, the Mongo client um, class uh, defined in the MongoDB node module. And so the way we do that is we do const and then in curly brackets we do mongo client equals require mongodb there's a name for this i can't remember it now anyone know in javascript what it's called when you you have um, like a function that returns like an array of stuff or an object of stuff and you automatically unpack it into variables. You can also do stuff like this with square brackets and you can say like one, two, three equals like function that returns an array. Yeah, it automatically like unpacks the array and assigns like the first three elements to those variables. There's a name. What's it called? Object destructuring. Cool. Okay. So this is called object destructuring. When we um, invoke the require, um, it returns an object with various attributes. We are basically assigning the first attribute to this variable Mongo client. So we could write this by assigning it to a normal variable and then do variable dot and get at that stuff. This is a more concise way of, of doing that thing. Not sure. Good question.
Yeah, there's probably a way to do it. I'm not sure how what that syntax would look like. All right, so we need to create a new object that is our connection to a database. So I'm going to call that variable client, and I'm going to say new Mongo client. And in the parentheses here is where we would pass um, the URL or the URI technically to the database, and it would have our username in it, and it would have our password in it. Um, we w we don't want to put that in our code here, right? Because this code is going to be committed to GitHub. And our GitHub repositories right now are private, but at some point they might be public. And if we put our username and password in a public GitHub repository, there are bots out there scraping through GitHub looking for username and passwords for things like Amazon Web Services and MongoDB. And then it takes them and then it starts like using your account and racking up charges um, by doing its computation stuff. So we don't want that. We don't want to ever put like a password or an API key in a file that gets committed to GitHub. What we do instead um, is we put this in something called a .env file. So over here in our web app project, we're gonna add a new file and it's called dot like period env, okay? You'll notice that it's like in a light gray because the .env file is excluded from being committed to GitHub. If we look at our source control stuff, we can see that I changed the package file today. When I installed stuff, the package lock file got changed. We've typed in db.js, but we have not typed in .env. Okay. So I'm going to put something in here and I'm going to put it in... Um, I'm going to put it also in uh, Canvas for you to copy. So let me stop recording that. All right. So before we create this new Mongo client, we're going to actually do what's called, we're going to actually load these environment variables. So load environment variables from a .env file into process.env. There are other variables we could put in our .env file. Right now we're just putting our MongoDB URI. We could put like API keys in there. We could put all sorts of different stuff in there. Um, the way we do this is we get a reference to the .env. So we're going to require the .env module. And then we're gonna say .env.config we're gonna configure that object by specifying an object with a attribute called path and the value of path will be .env. So we get a reference to the .env module, we invoke the config method, we pass an object whose single attribute path is the path to um, the fo config file we want it to read and now we can refer to that. In here, we can say process.env dot mongodb underscore URI. And if we had other stuff in our .env file, we could have things like port or API key or Google auth. We could reference all of those in the same way. So this is best practices for securely connecting to a database because now nothing that goes on to um, GitHub has any of our personal information in it. All right, we have a connection. Yes. Um, it gets pulled in, I think, when we do this. Oh, actually, no. So process is part of our Node.js process. Did you do? So that's where it comes from. But what, what initializes it is what initializes this attribute env. Um, this is the environment for the entire node process. By using env, 
we suck additional variables like into that environment. All right, so now we're gonna write an asynchronous function that we're gonna call later. So because it's asynchronous, we gotta start with the async keyword. Here's function. The function's just gonna be called run, and we'll invoke this later. Um, we're gonna have a try finally block because there might be an error when we try to connect to the database. Um, so we'll put everything that might fail inside of a try block. We are gonna try to connect to the database, but that's an asynchronous operation. So we, we want to actually wait until the connection is made. So we're gonna use that await keyword, and then we'll say client.connect. What this means is when we get to this line of code, our thread will be suspended waiting for the connection to the database to either be made or to fail. And the next line of code we're about to type won't be executed until we successfully connect to the database. So we know now on this next line of code that that promise has been resolved and we can act on it. If we didn't have the await here and we just did the client connect and then we tried to do some code with the database, it would fail because the connection hasn't finished yet, right? Our code is running faster than the connection can be made. Well, the async doesn't mean we're running it like in parallel or anything. This is just to tell JavaScript that there's asynchronous stuff going on in here. Um, kind of, uh, I don't know if this is the best analogy, but you know, like in, like in Java, if, if there's an exception thrown inside of a method, we have to put that in the method signature. I think of this is similar. It's not exactly the same, but. All right, so let's um, get our database and get our collection. Remember a database is a, a set of collections. So we're gonna say our database and collection code goes here. This is all based on what an example from MongoDB actually. So let's get a reference to the database, client.db. The name of our database is sample guides. Like I said, it's an example from MongoDB. Within that database, we want a specific collection. So I'll create a variable C-O-L-L, -L, short for collection, and I'll do db.collection. And the name of the collection we want is the collection of planets. So this is a sample database. There's a collection called planets, and then we can do stuff in there. So now we have a reference to the database, which we really only use to get a reference to the collection. Now that we have a reference to the collection, we can find specific documents within that collection. Think of this kind of like drilling into a folder in Google Drive or something. So we're gonna use this find method. There's a method called find. When we use find without arguments, it will return what's called a cursor. We're used to thinking of a cursor. Cursor is a MongoDB term. We know these as iterators, okay? So a cursor in MongoDB is analogous to an iterator in Java. So I'm trying to make these connections to us. So it's gonna return a cursor to all documents in the collection. Here's how we do that. We'll create a cursor variable and we'll say collection.find and that returns our cursor to all the documents within the collection planets. And then, whoa, sorry. And then we're gonna just log them. We're gonna say, let's log a little header so we know what's going on here. Here's all the planets. And then we have to do another await because we're gonna say print all cursor. We're gonna write this method print all in a moment. All right, we have a couple more things to write and then we'll be in good shape. So this will eventually print all the planets. We're in the middle of a try block. So we need to add the finally part 
like if this all finishes and we finally get here, um, we want to ensure that the client will close when we finish or error, okay? Either way, if things work or if they don't, we need to close our client. We don't wanna like leak that resource. So we'll do await client.close. That closes our connection to the database. Outside of our run function, we're gonna actually invoke it. We're gonna call this function. So we're gonna say run, but then we're gonna do a dot catch in case there's an error um, and we're gonna log that error. So this is a nice way to run a function, catch any exception that happened as a result of doing so and log it out. And the last thing we have to write, I think we'll have just enough time is the print all function. So async function, it's also asynchronous, print all. It takes a single argument, which is a cursor. The methods on a cursor are similar to those on Java iterators. So this will be familiar. We'll say while await, more waiting, cursor.hasNext. Basically, anytime we do anything on a cursor, that's it. We have to wait. It's a promise. It's talking to the database. So we have to wait for the cursors has next to be resolved. And then we can do console.log. And again, await <laughs> cursor.next. If we left out any of these, like if I left out this await, and we'll probably do this after break, um, it would print the promise, not the resolved value. Okay. When you right click and run on this, Um, when you right click and run on this, you should see it work. Let's see, run code, nope. Oh no, what did I do wrong? What's that? Well, this is, this is Mongo's thing. Maybe my environment's wrong. Let's check. <laughs> 